Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Cubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today we have Heath Squire. He is master food formulator and CEO of the Julian Bakery, which is a company that develops and sells transitional paleo foods. Products include paleo and primal products like the paleo protein bars, paleo wraps, paleo cereal, paleo chocolate, and much more. They're grain-free, gluten-free, GMO-free. Heath takes them himself. We'll talk about that. Heath learned the benefits of using vitamins and whole foods from his mother, Barbara, who's a certified nutritionist who founded the original Julian Bakery in the 1990s. I think it was 1990. By combining his background running tech companies with his parents' brick and mortar, Heath has grown the Julian Bakery into a worldwide brand. Heath, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And, you know, I always like to start, and you have the Primal Show, which is great. People should check that out. Um, a fun fact. I always like to start with a fun fact. There's two interesting fun facts. There's more if your wife told us some good ones. But you have yeah. a black belt, or going for your black belt in karate. Yes. And you take over 100 vitamins per day. I do. Maybe like 20 or 30 different types, but yeah. it all adds up. So what do you take? What do you actually take? What vitamins? You know, I like to tinker kind of, it's my own kind of biohacking kind of method to either, you know, brain boosters to amino acids mm -hmm. uh, to a, as I approach 40, I'm trying to boost, you know, testosterone, decrease my estrogen. There's a lot of things that I wouldn't call them supplements, but more uh, herbs and mm -hmm. you know, Chinese medicine kind of formulas that help us men as we age uh, yeah. increase testosterone and decrease estrogen. And that's yeah. kind of, uh, there's a natural decrease of testosterone over time. So yeah. I like to tinker as well as I lo love, you know, things like, you know, brain boosters and stuff like that, like Hooperzine. And there's just, also yeah, just, just, yeah, just lay them out. What, which ones you take? I'm curious, you know, what should be, you know, there may be someone older male. They're like, what should I be taking Heath? What do you, what do you actually take? Um, for, for me right now, it's like Tonkat Ali. There's something called horny goat weed, which is Chinese medicine. It's uh, for brain boosters. We got Hooperzine um, for decreasing estrogen. We actually sell this product called Estro X, mm -hmm. uh, which decreases uh, estrogen and increases uh, testosterone mm -hmm. naturally. So, I mean, there's so many people in the health and food industry which are, are just supplementing testosterone. I just find it... Um, I, I, my goal and my passion was really to find vitamins that could do it naturally without having to do like a testosterone replacement therapy. Right. And I want to keep my levels as high as possible. That way I'm feeling great. I'm energized through the day and I can shed fat easily. So when I do work out, it's you're getting the maximum result by keeping your testosterone levels high. Yeah. Even, yeah. even with women too, they have the same issue where their ovaries produce uh, testosterone, as you know. And um, their levels decrease also, so it's really about being in balance. I think so many people are out of balance because of food, um, and the food is throwing their hormones completely out of balance. They're overestrogenized because of the xenoestrogens in the food. Yeah. So, um, it's really, you know, I found a certain set of vitamins which really help uh, balance the hormones and get optimal results. Because I'm busy, and when I when I go to the gym, I want to get the maximum results. Yeah. And you're not going to get results unless your hormones are in balance. At the end of the day, yeah. you can work out as much as you want, and the the fat's still going to be there. I mean, unless your hormones mm -hmm. are balanced. And that Twitter picture is not Photoshop. That's actually you. That's me. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. was uh, last last year. We did oh. a whole photo shoot and spread. I'm really into practicing what I pre preach. Right. So um, that was my goal, you know. And I'm going to do probably one more photo shoot as I approach 40. I want to. My goal is to get an eight pack by August, which is when I turn 40. It looked so, like on that picture you had an eight pack, so it's almost there. But I want to like I want to go all the way with it. It's tough, you know, as you approach 40, you know, your testosterone levels. Um, it's harder to boost them, and you really have to be in like the high 800 range to in order to achieve that. Mm -hmm. No other way around it. So, so what about any? Um, you know, the brain boosters you talked about, obviously the testosterone, estrogen, any like multis or Bs or like what else 
is in that mix that you like? Or multi, like multivitamins and stuff like that. Yeah. I do wheatgrass. I do like ginger shots. Um, mm -hmm. So I try to get more of my vitamins and nutrients from that. I take omega, you know, um, three, six, nine, like all the different omegas. Mm -hmm. So, but um, yeah, from vitamin wise, I try to I try to take it all from food. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. So I want to get into the the early days in the background, but first I want to hear some of your top strategies and. First, what are the, some of the best sellers on the Julian Bakery? Um, right now, I mean, our protein bars are just this is going through the roof. I mean, we have eight flavors now. We're planning on launching like at least eight more flavors on the current line. Wow. We're also expanding into uh, what what uh, kind of a new diet called Pegan, which is the blend between uh, veganism and paleo. That's hilarious. Okay. Like, Did you coin that term? No. Oh, so it's but out there. Okay. It's been out, but I, I, I think that it, it's very interesting because a lot of vegans think that they're really healthy or just by being a vegan that the, you're going to lose a bunch of weight. Yeah. And I like to take their approach where if you're going to be a vegan, at least eat foods that are anti-inflammatory nature yeah. and that promote optimal health. Yeah. And so I plan on launching a variety of food and bars that uh, during the next year that will um, really be for that type of diet as well as um, kind of exploring more of the primal uh, diet um, products which basically is a paleo diet that incorporates more grass-fed dairy only not just dairy any kind of dairy but yeah. um, grass-fed specifically yeah. um, so because strict paleos don't eat dairy is that correct yeah. yeah yeah so it's very limiting uh, if you do well on dairy I like I do completely awful on dairy it causes all sorts of mucus and inflammation for me yeah. but if you do well on dairy um a lot of people do well on grass-fed like whey protein for instance mm -hmm. or raw dairy and things like that so i think for some people it is okay but i personally think it's better just to avoid dairy altogether yeah so the protein bars let's talk about the eight flow which was the first that you came out with we actually launched six bars six bars uh, at once so to start and then added uh, coconut shred and just recently almond fudge. And then we have a vanilla pudding coming out, but we have glazed donuts, cinnamon roll, like uh, chocolate mint. I mean, all these extremely unhealthy flavors, which is really. Right. I saw like a Cinnabon, like a donut, cinnamon yeah. roll on the, the cover. I'm like, should I be eating this? This this looks like too, too good, right? I mean, it's really trying to give people back what they are taking away from their diet when they go paleo. Yeah. So a lot of people are like, cavemen didn't have donuts. Well, it's not about that. It's about trying to give Like, how do you know? Were you there? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. It's trying to get something back to people that, that they may have taken out of their diet when they do go paleo. It's also educating people about paleo while giving them health food that's disguised as junk food. And, and and from a marketing standpoint, we've seen just tremendous results from yeah. from the style of advertising because one, it gets people's attention, and the, the you know the first thing everybody everybody does when they look at it is they're going to look at the label. You know, they're going to like what's in this glazed donut paleo protein bar? It can't be paleo, and then they turn it over. Yeah, sure enough, it is because it's gluten free, it's dairy free, it's legume free, it's free from all this stuff that you know that you that would prevent you from normally having it. So um, it, it definitely works. And I think that's what it's all about in this day and age. You have to do something that's over the top yeah. because there's the market's so saturated, especially in protein bar market, that you have to do something that's really going to stand out. Yeah. And I think that's what we've done um, with, with the, the bar line. Um, I see, you know, our business as a whole has been growing 50% plus year over year. That's and awesome. I think it's awesome. really being... Uh, creative and innovative in the space that is so overly saturated with just products and ingredients that cause emotional, like uh, gastric distress, I would say, not emotional distress, but um, in, in, gastric you know, distress could lead to emotional distress. It really right. does. Yeah. I mean, there's so many um, bars with, you know, just tons of sugar alcohols and inulin and all these ingredients which just wreak havoc on your digestive system. And, sh and at the end of the day, you just, you're bloated. You feel worse yeah. after you eat this bar than you did before. And our bars are all about prebiotic fiber, prebiotic fiber and now we're adding probiotic fiber into it. Mm. So you actually, your stomach feels better after you consume our bar than before. Yeah. 
I want to talk about the development and the idea of the flavors and the bars. So those six bars, what's your process for developing? Because you could develop any flavors, right? What's your process? What's the most popular bar out of those six? And then how did you develop? Um, it's really, it's a, depending on the protein source. Like, for instance, yeah. like egg white is uh, very neutral tasting. So you could almost put anything with it in terms of flavor. So it was really um, coming up with flavors like a, like the glazed donut, for instance, like a maple glazed donut. Um, it would have a mapley taste, so it would be kind of soft and chewy, like a maple glazed donut would. So we all know that everybody loves donuts, right? So right. So is that how you thought about it? Like, what does everyone like, but they shouldn't be eating, or what? What's your process for thinking of flavors? I, marketing background. Yeah. So, um, I, I come from what's going to sell first and then how do we make it? And you backtrack. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's um, in the, the glazed donut? Um, it's basically egg white protein, prebiotic fiber. You have um, like a maple extract sort of flavor. Um, and then there's sunflower uh, seed butter. And, and so it's these really just basic ingredients with just no junk. There's no sugar alcohols. There's no gluten or just anything – that would would cause you to have issues, and um, it's people are responding really well to it. Yeah. So with the original bar of that, do you whip it up in the kitchen with your mom and like try different ingredients, or what's your? Because you're the master food formulator, so I want to hear your process for this. Um, well, my mom uh, has stepped aside since 2011. She had a, um, a stroke, unfortunately. Mm, sorry to hear that. Wow. So um, she's no longer a part of it. But that being said, you know, I think her focus was more like on um, bread and my focus was more on yeah. addressing my, my allergies and my dietary issues, mm -hmm. struggling with weight, like, you know, back in um, 2010. Really? I, it's hard to so, believe by looking at those pictures. Right. Well, you know, and that's just, I, I, like I said, I like to practice what I preach. So I started on my own journey and quest to develop these products, including bars and protein powders and yeah. all the products we have today were really designed for myself. And if other people like them and they want to buy them, then, then so be it, you know. But I was on a quest to, to find optimal health for myself. Right. And yeah. um, the end result was these products that, you know, actually work when you consume them and you, you combine them with diet. So yeah. um, my mom did, didn't have uh, so much uh, any input really in the products that we have today we took this I, back in 2000 like I was nine and ten we started transitioning from like a traditional bakery that was doing like low carb and um, uh, low fat products mm -hmm. and then started really focusing on uh, low carb and going grain free and then paleo um, and that drive and that those formulations were done by myself because it I would like, I wanted to have bread on my diet, you know, yeah. I want, so all these products were really, they really stemmed from that. Yeah. So with those, you put the bars out, um, what's the best method to actually sell them? I mean, you're consuming them, you, you know, but you want to get them out to the masses. What, what worked best? Um, I mean, we've been a long time partner of Whole Foods, so, um, they've been very gracious and, and we've been able to really, um, uh, um, develop new products and they've been taking them on uh, nationwide mm. and then we also uh, offer a variety of outlets really on online and uh, Amazon and we have so many different partners that and uh, small retail sh uh, health food stores across the country and now world um, that sell our products so it's nice um, formulating new products now because we can just roll them out into um, this great distribution network right um, it, it definitely was hard to achieve that in the beginning but yeah. i think what the was the first product that you got in whole foods um i would say it was a, a slew of um different like breads basically like sprouted breads and mm -hmm. uh, it was all of our bread yeah. and the bread led to our other products like now they're starting to take our cereals and crackers yeah. and so yeah the cereal looks cool i want to try that one yeah it's amazing so it's like uh a not so sweet like uh, frosted flake. Yeah. I mean, it's only coconut, right? I mean, that's what the cereal is made of. It is. It's only coconut, but it's dehydrated in a, such a way where it makes a, a flake. You know, it's not. Uh, 
it's not like a coconut shred. It's actually a flake and it, it's crunchy and it's like amazing. Uh, imagine like the best tasting raisin brand you've ever had. Yeah. You know, that's what it would taste like if you added raisins to it. So, so I could trick my daughters into eating this, oh, this, yeah. uh, this uh, healthy cereal that is to taste good. Yeah. No, I think, um, you know, you, you bring up your kids. I mean, my, my daughter is three and a half right now. And now my formula is really starting, starting to focus on um, food for kids because it's right. just so saturated with sugar and just the junk out there and GMOs. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just insane what's going into these products yeah. for kids. Um, a lot of uh, the newer products that are going to be coming out will be very kid focused. Yeah. So what's one of the products that's inspired by your daughter that you're creating because of her? Um, we're working on, uh, like pancakes, uh, like mm. we're, it's on the site. Yeah. We there's... have a pancake mix, but there's like these little like silver dollar pancakes, which we'll be releasing, um, that, uh, something that we really want to go after. And then also, um, kids protein bars. Mm. So kind of like half the amount of protein of a traditional bar. Um, a lot of the bars out there, um, are just packed with sugar and GMOs and just junk. So, um, uh, really trying to go after that market. Um, will be something exciting. So. Yeah. What's in the pancake mix? What's? It's just like coconut, almond flour, egg white. You know, it's just mm -hmm. real basic stuff. Yeah. So the for people who are like you know Heath, I want to be in Whole Foods, right? What's are what are some of the disadvantages and advantages of being in Whole Foods? I don't think there's there's any disadvantage. Really, it's just one more outlet. Um, people love convenience, so you yeah. know. Whether it be Whole Foods or any you know uh, natural food store, it's really the convenience factor of the instant gratification of not having to wait for the product mm -hmm. to be shipped to them. Um, so Whole food, Foods is great. I mean, they they're like any other uh, chain where they have different buyers that have a submission period. Right. You sub you submit your products, and you know if if the buyers like the taste and um, you know the packaging and everything, then you get accepted into a region, and and you know. That's why you have to be really creative and keep coming up with great tasting products. So, how hard was it to get in originally? Um, I, I think you know it's definitely a lot more difficult now. I mean, we've been with them since um, I want to say like '07 or something, long long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't as much competition, but depending on the category, like for instance, we started with bread and now we're in cereal. Um, it just depends on the category. So I'd say it's much more difficult now because there's so many people that want to be in there. So mm -hmm. that's why uh, when, when I do formulate products, it's got to be something just over the top that's just better than everything else out on the market. Mm -hmm. So when, when I formulate, I, I will buy everybody's product out on the market and try and it, market research, yeah. and then come up with something better. And to be honest with you, it's very easy to do because most people aren't choosing the best ingredients or there's just much more superior ingredients now. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I could see a disadvantage being, you know, when you compare online to there, obviously you're selling it at wholesale, you know, compared to if you're selling it on your website, you it's full retail, right? Um, it, sure. In a way, but you know, to be honest with you online, you're, you're advertising, right? So you are, you have that huge chunk of advertising yeah. coming out of the margin anyways. Where in Whole Foods, they're selling it and pushing it. So at the right. end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether it's going in Whole Foods or you I think there's it. a wash there. Yeah, because additionally online, now to be competitive, you have to offer free shipping. So there's another margin hit on top of the advertising cost and getting people to your site. So, um, you know, I, I would say there is doesn't matter. Either yeah. way, you yeah. think about the same amount. So that's the the offline. Talk about some of the on, best online strategies to sell the bars, whether it's on Amazon or your site. What works well for online? You know, if you're going to launch a product in today's age, don't be afraid to spend money. You know, and if you don't feel comfortable spending money, then you should, should probably not um, launch that product yeah. because because your yeah. background is in internet marketing tech stuff. So I'm really curious of what you think the best methods are for this. I think, um, and now today there's conversion codes with Google AdWords, there's Facebook, and it's really all about the cost per acquisition, so mm -hmm. ROI on the money spent. So if you have a good product and you have a good website, you're going to have a, a great ROI. And now, you know, 
with these conversion codes in place, you can spend as much money as possible. And if the ROI is low enough, then you're, you can spend as much as you want and you're going to get an incredible return on your investment. So um, I think don't be afraid to spend money if you have a good product. And if you're, you're worried about spending money or you're not getting a great ROI, then your, your product probably needs to be improved or changed or your website. So I mean, my strategy has been to refine our website or refine our message to create um, a product that's unique and that, that people want. There's got to be a demand for it. And, um, you know, just to make the best product possible and market market that product to as many people as possible. So um, the market is saturated and we cover multiple categories where the market is extremely, you know, just full of so many products. So yeah, how do you stick out from that? Yeah, um, just, you know, we we started off small. I mean, Back in, uh, I would say, 2009, we started doing AdWords, and we were in like 40 stores nationwide. Yeah. And um, right away, we, we jumped to like 100, 200 really? stores. Because the advertising not only brings in online business, but you also have that customer education, and it creates a customer demand within the stores. So then the customers start going into the they stores. They ask for it. Yeah, so then mm. that just grows your footprint. So yeah. it's money well spent. <laughs> That's amazing. So so you went from 20 stores to 40 stores, and then what was the upward, what was the next big milestone for, for stores-wise? I lost count because um, through distribution, you, you kind of lose the, the full number, but it's thousands, and now we're in stores worldwide. Yeah. We're really seeing on like Australia, UK, Canada. It is all opening up, and we have all, all of Europe and, um, you know, is there a special process that you had to go through to get into like Australia or do the people who distributed it in the U.S. to Whole Foods also had connections in Australia? Just a different distributor and then you work on different packaging, you know, that's compliant, uh, you know, so they kind of handle all the, you know, specific logistics. Re- yeah, because I mean, every the nutritional facts change, so you have to... Um, basically recalculate all the you know formula for their nutritional facts Mm, yeah so you mentioned conversion what did you mean by conversion code um well google and facebook both have conversion code which is installed on your website so Mm -hmm. that code basically uh enables you to track the sales i see so let's say uh, your ad's running on facebook and we've all seen the ads you click on it you go to your site they check out Facebook captures the dollar value of that sale and mm. sends it back into your Facebook campaign. Yeah. So the, the total dollar amount. And so then all of a sudden you, let's say if you spend a thousand dollars, it tells you you get a hundred customers. So yeah. Have you found on Facebook, like uh, a channel like Facebook, do people like a certain product best from Facebook or does it? It no? doesn't really. It just depends on who you're marketing it to. So yeah. there's different audiences. Facebook's pretty incredible where it starts uh, developing audiences based on the people who buy. So then you mm. start creating these huge segments of people to market to. Right. So um, and it, it basically starts gleaning information from every person that buys, whether it be demographic information, age, what they're into. So then you start developing audiences based on those specific people that are buying. Yeah. And one of the things I notice, Heath, is you guys have a really good social media presence. Um, can you talk about the social media strategy a little bit? Um, well, Facebook used to be amazing in terms of giving, you know, you, you would post something on there and you get a ton of free people, you know, a ton of free traffic. But that's now you have to pay for it. Now you have to pay for it. Yeah. Instagram is like that now, but it's going to change really quick. Um, you know, basically you're going to start paying for that few, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. You're flipping through Instagram, mm-hmm. you know, those pictures you're going to pay for. Do you that. think that's going to change? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is. And as people, as you like more and more things on Instagram too, it gets more competitive for that maybe 30 seconds to a minute you're spending on Instagram, flipping through the most recent, you know, updates from the people you're following. So, um, Twitter has finally come around to being, something that's of interest, but they also have conversion code as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
but um, they they had a tough time until recently. They would they would charge you for traffic, and it, they actually weren't sending the traffic. So really, they were completely overbilling. Wow, uh, it was a real issue. Um, Facebook actually had that in the beginning too. They would say they sent traffic that wasn't picked up by anybody, including our server. But uh, they, <laughs> it's, they, it's that's how good but, Facebook is. They could send yeah. you traffic, and it doesn't even get detected. Yeah, so um, Twitter recently fixed it, so I got to commend them, and um, I, I think that it's just another platform where you know you just got to really spend a lot of time watching your ROI and the money spent. There's so many tweaks and tricks to be basically being able to, you know, it could be your landing page, it could be the picture that you're using, it could be the the text you're using. Yeah. You never, there's just so many different facets of uh, you got to test it. And you just don't know what what the audience that you're marketing to is going to respond to. Yeah, um, and then you part of that social media strategy is the content. You know, you know what you do is actually um, produce some really great recipes, you know, on your site, and that I'm sure drives a lot of attention. What are some of the most popular recipes you've put out? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I'll go to like um, I, I'm kind of an on the go person, yeah. and we get a lot of recipes. I mean, we have tons of recipes from people on Instagram taking pictures. So a lot of the recipes are actually from our own. User customers. generated. Um, That's great. But the most popular ones are are when I'll, I'll go to like Rubio's or Chipotle or my on-the-go meals where I go out and get some shrimp, throw it in like a coconut wrap, yeah. throw some salsa and avocado in there and take a picture of it. People love on-the-go recipes because – Quick, like, easy. I don't have time to cook. So yeah. – and I, I do, I really enjoy cooking, but I'm always on the go. So I like to teach people how to grab some food when they're out, come back and throw it in a wrap when they get home, yeah. you know, and just to make, make um, eating really easy. Uh, I think all the recipes are really around that. I love like um, grass fed ground beef with avocado and salsa on it in a, in a wrap. It's just, it's just so easy to do. So, yeah. and that's, I'll, I'll cook at home. I mean, cooking up some ground beef just takes a couple of minutes. It's so easy. You toss it in the wrap and good to go. Yeah. So from the you know selling standpoint, there's a lot of great information. What about on the um, what mistakes do you think people are are doing on the for e-commerce? What do you see people? What mistakes are they making? Um, I, and I'm guilty of this too. I and I, and it's really not even my fault, but I think it, it's something that. The creative, the, there's not enough great graphic or web designers or people out there that are developing great sites. There's not enough of those people, and they're so heavily saturated. We're, we've been trying to launch a site for the last year, and it's like there's not Like enough, a rebrand or a different site? Yeah, like a redesign, redesign. a new e-commerce platform. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think the future is really in making checking out easy. I think Shopify does a great job mm -hmm. of that. Do you use Shopify or do you use something else? Uh, no. It's a custom, custom we like WordPress on a, on a back-end commerce site. But yeah. um, basically, um, I, I like the new e-commerce packages that are coming out, and they allow for uh, like auto order, so you don't even have to think about ordering. You just set it all up what day you want it delivered, and, and it delivers. I think that's kind of the future of e-commerce. It's just um, you know an auto delivery program, you know, where you don't really have to think about it. So I think that's something that more people need to implement, and we're looking forward to doing that also, especially when you're on a diet. Because let's let's take a protein powder. You know that there's 30 servings in it, so maybe you go through one a month, and then you go through X amount of coconut wrap. So you could set up an auto delivery. Right. Not think and about it. Makes your diet really easy. I think it, everybody wants to have more time, so the easier you can make it. And uh, for people to order, the better. Yeah. And uh, I think you know, poor, poor web design. I mean, we're really looking like we we have all the pictures taken on a nice white background, and uh, we haven't even up updated our site yet because we've been waiting for this complete redesign. Yeah. But I, I wish there was more great you know web designers out there. You know, and and there's just not enough. And the the ones that are out there are either really slow or they're not. They're just like on their own timetable. So I think it's something that everybody struggles right. with. Great creative people, um, you know, good creative people. They're just so busy. There's just not enough of them. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at them. They're just like, 
you know, they're just so busy between your work and everybody else's. So. Yeah. What's another mistake you see people making? That's a good one. Uh, on with just their site? The e-commerce in general. Um, cause I know you do a lot of market research and you'll get all the bar. It could be from a buying experience. Like, you know, cause you go out and you purchase all the competitors products. Sure. Not having PayPal would be a huge one, you know, take PayPal. It's the easiest way to check out, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and PayPal is just makes it seamless for people to check out and they don't have to worry about their credit card information. So, um, I think that would definitely be one. And just trying to make checkout as easy as possible. I mean, even our checkout's not where I want it to be. So it's definitely something that we continue to try to improve. How do you want to improve your checkout? You think? Um, I, I think just being able to have less steps, you know, you know, trying to get people checked out within a couple of steps. If, if people have PayPal, I think that it's basically like two or three steps. Mm-hmm. But outside, if you were to check out outside of that, it's, it's too many steps. So yeah. So I want to go back to early on, Heath. Um, obviously, a big influence for you was your were your parents, and they were kind of ahead of the trend of this of this health thing. So, what did that look like in your household? What did meals look like? What was your mom cooking for you back when you were a kid? Um, we ate a a lot. Everything was organic, and she was. We had our own garden. I actually grew up in Costa Mesa, and like basically, um, uh, we had goats and chickens. Really. Uh, f- fruit trees and, and we had what kind of fruit of, trees what did you have uh, apricot and i mean we had like just a whole mm. vegetable garden. she was she was into you know homegrown uh gardening way before anybody else was way ahead right. of her time and um so um we ate a lot of just organic rice and you know back then carbs didn't really matter none of us knew about gluten either but um, I actually had, I, I'm not a celiac, but I have a, um, autoimmune issue with, um, gluten itself. So oh, really? It actually, um, uh, triggers me to just my whole autoimmune issue. Like I just shut down. Like I start getting really tired. Mm. Uh, and, you get a lot of fatigue and yeah. And I, I really had a problem with like brain fog during school and not until really in my late twenties, early thirties, did I start noticing that after I had a sandwich, Mm. extremely tired you saw so, a pattern there once i started removing the wheat from my diet and all gluten um and eventually all grain uh, that brain fog went away i had a lot more clarity and i had steady energy throughout the day and it, it wasn't really uh blood sugar related sure that does cause a spike and an issue but this was just a complete like over i, I had i would go take a nap and, you rejected you know, I, it I, yeah I'm in my 20s well, why am i taking a nap right so um I had the same sort of issue in school, and unfortunately, nobody knew about that back in the day. Yeah, even so, now, it's hard to diagnose that. I mean, how do you know what's what's causing it? It could be like, oh, I just didn't sleep, or you know, it could be a million different things. Sure, and you know, I look, I pay attention to my daughter, for instance, and um, I also have an issue with dairy, where it just makes me extremely nasally and like a ton of mucus. And you know, are your kids mucusy? You know, are they? Uh, having energy all day? Are they feeling sluggish? You know, how are they performing in school? Yeah. I think there are signs. You just have to pay attention to them because they're not going to be able to communicate. Hey, mom and dad, I got brain fog. You know, yeah. they don't know what it is. <laughs> right. How did that look? Like as a kid, right? You don't want to be different from the other kids. Did you reject that way of thinking and the foods when your your friends maybe eating Twinkies and whatever else? Like, what was your? Yeah, to be honest with you, I was like embarrassed of my lunch. You know. Um, yeah. What's your lunch? What, what, I just I would never. Like, do you want to trade this goat milk for your Doritos? Or like, no, yeah. Heath. Like, get away from me. Like, that's what... how it was. Yeah, but it, it was. Uh, it's unfortunate because I actually was so embarrassed I wouldn't like bring out my food, you know, in front of the other kids. My mom would put like raw onions in it, so my lunch smelled and that nobody else's did, you know. So right. things like that, sure. But I think nowadays that, you know, being healthy and having healthy food is actually kinda cool and you know, it's not it doesn't have to be yeah. so it's not so different anymore. You know? Yeah. So when you were growing up, Heath, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um I Probably wanted to be in the military. I really? Think. Yeah, uh, some some like special forces or something like that. I don't know. But when yeah. did your parent your parents started the bakery in the nineties? Yes. So, um, how old were you when they started the bakery, and were you kind of a part of that process? 
Um, like 15 or something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, so you're young. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in the bakery, and I, I grew up, you know, my mom was always trying to help people to, to help them reach, you know, better health, whether it be through vitamins or uh, through, you know, selling organic bread. And at the time, the fad was really low-fat diets, you know, which now that I look at it, it's not, it's, um, I understand the purpose of it. You know, you cut out fat and you're cutting out nine times the calories from each, each gram of fat. You, right. you into right. The problem was, is you were, they were still keeping their carbs high. So if you go, if you go low fat and low carb, you're going to get way better results than keeping a high carb, high fat, which we all know stores tons of fat on the body. Mm-hmm. So I think, um, I think it's not completely, it wasn't completely a bad fat. It, they just didn't have it all the way correct. Yeah. So. What did you see your parents go through with starting and running the bakery? What lessons do you learn from them? Um, you know, when you're a small business owner, you really can't do everything. I'm sure you have to in the beginning, but know when to delegate. Know when to um, know when when doing every single task in the in the business yeah. is keeping you from growing the business overall. Yeah. Um, you saw think, them doing too much, yeah. Not delegating enough, yeah. And, and they never got out in front and was able to really grow their their company the way they needed to. And um, you know, I think finding the right people for the right position, and then which frees you up as a business owner to grow the company and formulate or you know be uh, just innovate uh, in general. A lot of business. Owners just get stuck in the day-to-day grind, you know, and I think that's um, a real problem because then their business just dies, you know. What made you decide to join them eventually? Because you were in tech and computers for a long time. Uh, My dad uh, passed in 06. Oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. I'm bringing up all this bad stuff with your parents. uh, Okay. And then, um, you know, my mom ran for a little while, but the business was really growing at the time. And um, And really helped. I came in in like oh nine, and because um, she started having some heart problems and stuff, and then um, just to try to free her up. So um, I think you know the loss of my dad kind of triggered just the, there's a you know a tremendous issue with you know stress and you know she was married for like forty five years. So wow. it's just a lot for somebody to deal with. So yeah, she had to do that and run the whole business and everything like that. Yeah, I kind of saw an opportunity where. They were selling bread online way before. I mean, I, I never thought it could be done. So they um, were. So early on, they were doing it. Yeah, I mean, they started their site like '07 or something like that. '06. Yeah. So it was. It was in the beginning, and I, um, I was like, no, don't sell bread online. They they did it anyways. And it ended up really taking off, and then um, their site got so big where I was just like, you know what? Let me apply what I love to do, which is marketing, with with their business and, and then um, also run the company and uh, ended up working out. So, so when you went on, you went on board in 2009 with them. Yeah. And so what did you implement when you got on board? Um, we started advertising. That was really the first thing, you know, and it was, there was no conversion code. So you were really advertising blind. Yeah. So it was kind of like you had to compare your existing sales to, the days that when you would advertise so then you started you know comparing all right well if you spend a hundred dollars it added this many customers there was nothing adding it up so it was just you were rolling the dice so but um since nobody was using adwords back then or not as many people um right it was like the wild west yeah yeah the market was huge and it's, it's far different than today i mean really Google's changed a lot for us. I mean, we used to spend the most amount of money with them. It's definitely not that way anymore. Um, they actually came out and did a video with us uh, where we had such such great success with them um, using their Google Display Network. But that network has really died, you know, for them. It's just, you know, it's not as effective anymore. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest challenges, Heath, with growing so fast like that? Because it comes with challenges too. Um. Sure, just finding the right people as you grow. So, I mean, um, have, growing your company and growing as fast as we did, yeah. you have to find people that um, you can depend on, you know, yeah. that are cool people. Sometimes you never know until, you you know, you they're, they're on board and, and uh, 
they just start becoming flaky or they have personal right. issues. So well, we have such a great team now, and um, I don't think you can you, know, you can't do it by yourself. So yeah. I think really spending the time, you know, finding the great you know great people you can depend on is key. What kind of staff do you need to run the business? Like I know you're mentioning one thing your parents didn't do early on was, you know, get people to do different tasks. Sure. I mean, I was always of the mindset where because I'm a big picture kind of person, um, delegating to managers for each department is mm-hmm. really important. Uh, and then having those managers feed you that information of what's going on in the day-to-day business allows you allowed me to really get out in front and grow the business as a whole and stay focused. Um, So the first thing I did was really departmentalize and um, put managers in place over each department. Um, I think before we had a lot of automation, we were up to like over 80 employees. Wow. So it's a lot. um, And then automation, you know, we were able to really cut our workforce in half and then really weed out the bad people. And, and now, um, um, I mean, I think it's a great model for any any business owner is to really put key people in place over each department and then have them funnel either to another general manager and then the general manager reports to you. Or, um, but it, it's 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 really simple. Yeah, <laughs> it's so not a lot of people don't do it. So a lot so of people try to be that manager in every department. So. Yeah, what kind of automation? Um, whether it be production automation, so you have you know. Um, you know, instead of rolling bread by hand, you have a machine that cuts and weighs it and packages it to um, bar automation. You can do it by hand or you can have a machine cut it and weigh it and wrap it. And so it just depends on the product. product so Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, 80 people is a lot to manage. Um, so when you came on, you put a lot of processes in place. What was the next big milestone you hit once you took over in 2009? Um. I think, you know, in, in 09, as we grew, you know, it was really uh, trying to find that, that the, the right people. So weeding out the bad ones, mm. developing the automation. And also at the same time, keeping uh, an eye on the different trends that were going on, whether it was low carb, then really in like 2010, 11, you had like zero carb come out mm. and then you had um, grain free start to be real popular back then. And, then obviously paleo. So, so you had to kind of think about putting different messaging on the site and on the on the foods, or what? What do you consider with that? Um, it was really just changing our products, our product line. So we did away with the entire original product line mm. to, and then started developing uh, products that were grain free and gluten free and uh, low carb, high fiber. So. And the products were really in line with my own dietary needs at the time. So I was formulating around uh, my own diet because I went from, I would say, like 220 down to like 187 wow. and and, um, and just through diet, you know, and working out. I was working out the same if, and um, I was just dietary change at that point. Yeah. Four or five times a week, you do some cardio, some weightlifting. And it really all comes down to diet at the end of the day. What did the online component of the Julian Bakery look like in 2009 compared to today? Um, I would say, you know, we've, I don't know, just grown just like a thousand percent. I mean, it's just, uh, it's unreal because, you know, we're in food. So if customers are happy, your food, you know, your customers. They keep buying it. Right. Yeah. So it's just like it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, um, your, your level of customers. And we also send out like a biweekly email to our customers, letting them know like, you know, diet tips and recipes and products. And a lot of times people dislike it because it's a reminder, you know, it's like, hey, oh, yeah, I got to order. You know? mm-hmm. so, um, I think we, we definitely do a good job of staying in touch with everybody. Yeah. So. I'm just wondering what, from your experience what you slowly tweaked from the site when you took it over, obviously you weren't full time, like you're probably revamping things or there's certain things you added or subtracted to the actual site or automation uh, from, you know, online, not just like the, from the food preparation, but online. Yeah. I mean, we started with just bread and then we started to develop, uh, we expanded on that. So we did protein powders and, and um, 
chocolate and crackers and uh, you know all, all these different products. So we were increasing the amount of products that we were offering. And I was also selling other people's products too that complimented us. Like we sell vitamins. People are like, why do you sell vitamins? Well, because why not? You know, you're already buying a, a dietary product. Why not buy some supplements as well? Yeah. You know, so um, that's people started to respond to that. It's like, oh, I can get everything at one place. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being that, why do you sell books? Because it's convenient. Why not throw a book in your cart, you know? Yeah. So. What that, you know, that comes into play. What um, paleo experts do you follow that you think other sh people should should read or look at what information they're putting out? Um, I think, you know, Mark System does a great job. And Dr. Cordain, you know, are two great ones. I mean, there's really so many, but um, there's just some great resources on the paleodiet.com and marksdailyapple.com. I think they have great discussion forums and great information overall. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how I started, you know, my journey is, is really clean information for them. Rob Wolf's another one that's, you know, got a lot of information. He's more technical, you know, but um, I think that there's a lot of information out there that uh, you got to look for the people that, A, look the way you want to look. So never take advice from somebody that doesn't look the way you want to look, whether it be a trainer or a person giving dietary information. Right. I Practice what they preach. Yeah, I have a real problem with that. So uh, I think that um, growing up, I saw a lot of that in the nutritional field. You have people coming over preaching health, and it's like they have you know a, a beer, beer belly. You know, it's like you obviously haven't figured it out for yourself. So how can you be dispensing advice? Right, right. It's it's a good method to <laughs> to weed out who you take advice from for sure. Um, you know, I heard about you and, and the Julian Bakery from the, the founder of Scubana, Chad Rubin, loves your paleo pizza crust. And what's in that product? Um, there is uh, egg whites, almond flour. Yeah. Um, you have uh, pumpkin, uh, pumpkin flour. And um, that's about it. Yeah. I mean, what's your personal favorite product out I mean, of all your, your different ones? It's it's lower in carbs than a traditional pizza. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite products. But that product, I mean, we sell a ton of it. I mean, it's my fam, my my wife and my whole family just they really love that product. It's the most like pizza like crust you're gonna have, and it's really easy to make. You literally add water and roll it out, add your toppings to it. Um, I would say that's definitely one of my favorites. I mean. Uh, right now, I'm really into the almond fudge uh, paleo protein bar we just launched. It's, mm -hmm. it's delicious. It's like almond fudge. It's it's really um, it's a great combo. So yeah, yeah. What else would be a good lesson for people in e-commerce? Um, you know, considering the big milestones. I mean, you do a lot of interesting things from online to offline. What are some more? I guess um, what's another big milestone that you hit? Um, I don't know, you talked about the staffing. What about with, um, I don't know if it's distribution or sales or products, some of the, the milestones you consider milestones as you took over? I think a lot of people are taking money too soon. So, I mean, as you get bigger and have a certain size, I think um, we've been able to, uh, fortunately, just been able to keep it just just us. I don't have to take any partners. People yet. like do a lot of VC or they take on investors type of thing. If you're growing really fast, you know, don't take on money unless mm. you really have to. There's as you get of a certain size, the money's cheap. You know, go to your bank. You know, it's like the the rates are super low, or there's all sorts of different loans you can get without having to give up a piece of your company. And I think as as we grow, sure, it would be nice to get funded and maybe there's a proper time but if you're growing so fast and you don't have to take it or you know it's uh you can squeeze by without taking it and do it yourself sure it takes a little bit longer but uh try to hang in there and don't take money until you really have to i think that's something a lot of people struggle with is they'll take money from investors and then the whole company ends up folding because they have to share too much of the, the margin you know mm, yeah so yeah we, that's a good one we a lot of people are affiliate based too, I think, and there's nothing wrong with affiliate marketing. We don't even have an affiliate program. Um, and it's something that maybe we'll do, yeah. but what's the people, reason? Yeah. 
But a lot of people, you know, give up so much of their margin that they can't really grow. So it ends up stifling their growth. Yeah. Because I'm sure you get approached by people. Yeah. And I think it's nice. I mean, we, um, I, I think a lot of people will give up too much money and they really need that, that margin to grow. And it's, there's, the money is better spent really, I would say, in online marketing because you can control the ROI um, if you know what you're doing. So, yeah. What do you consider, obviously you've had a huge upward growth. What have been some of the roadblocks that you've hit along the way? Um, I, we make a really unique product with, you know, I would say ingredients, which some of them are, you know, traded commodities. But we, the first product that we had truly great success with was the paleo bread. And paleo bread uses egg whites. And um, it's happened twice so far where pretty much all the chickens in the U.S. like died off for a little while. Really? Um, to the avian bird flu. This just happened recently. Oh, last wow. year. And it, it drives egg white prices through the roof. Mm. We're talking like drupling the single biggest ingredient. So all of a sudden, you know, it's like, do you raise prices or do you stop the line? So yeah. I'll also using ingredients that are really unique that we use, like sometimes almond flour, you know, goes through the roof or um, yeah, you have uh, issues with uh, supply, but now the ingredients we use are, are are in much greater supply because a lot more people are using it. But in the beginning, it was really tough. So making sure that you have a great supply chain all the way through and mm. have multiple sources for ingredients is it's definitely important. That's a great one. Thanks for sharing that, Heath. Yeah, it's something I wouldn't have thought of. Oh yeah, like you're buying commodities, and if those things go up, you're kind of screwed in a sense. So what do you do with the price? Like if those go up. What do you decide as the executive? What's the decision? Well, it's definitely a point where you have to stop production or you just try to write it out. So you end up, and there's many times where we may, we lost a lot of money, I would say, and a lot of money. Um, because you want to keep the prices the same for the customers? You don't want to stop the flow and the distribution because if you do, then you lose your shelf space. So there's that. So you have to kind of weigh the benefit. It's tough. Yeah. That's why I want to know what you did. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean we we wrote it out and we definitely are still paying for it. So <laughs> I mean it was definitely a lot of money lost. Yeah. But uh you have to look at this from a long term, you know, point of view where um you're in distribution and you know, provided that uh, people continue to eat gluten and grain free, which we feel that they will, this is really a long term project. So yeah. I mean, the almond and the egg, I mean, there's nothing you can do, I guess. It's tough to avoid. You know, it's sort of like that's environmental. I mean, you like you said, you could, I guess, get more supply partners. So maybe just to, to see the different prices, but probably they're going to not be that far off from each other. When the egg goes at all, like everybody, because it's right. a it's traded commodity. So everybody's, you know, feel, feels and a lot of people just go out of business. Yeah. I mean including the egg suppliers that go out of business because they have these contracts. They're locked into this pricing. They have to supply. So they have to go out of business to get out of them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, any other roadblocks that are important to mention? Um, I think, you know, like I said, just really focusing on multiple sources for whatever it is that you're making, have more than one vendor and definitely don't put all your eggs in one basket, whether, and that goes for, you know, suppliers and also product, you know, have more than one product. Don't roll up, don't put all your effort into just one product. Create multiple products. That's why we have so many products because you never know which one's going to be a hit. Yeah. What's the hardest part about running the business now for you? Um, it's really not hard anymore. So not <laughs> really. Yeah. Nothing not, hard about it. No. Oh. It's it's actually. I mean, I'm in a great place. You know, from a business point of view. Um. We, you know, like I said, I've implemented my plan of really delegating and and, um, and outsourcing it. It's mm-hmm. just I, I get a focus on what I, I I get a focus on developing recipes and marketing, which is what I love to do every day. Yeah, so I'd say um, as we grow, it, I, I really get a focus on formulating, which is what I love to do right now. So yeah. I would say there's nothing hard about running the business. It, it's more about all right, we're going to formulate another product and let's roll it out into the marketplace and let's see if it's a hit. Yeah. What's the best delegation you made that maybe you waited a little bit too long and after you did it, you just were like, thank God I finally did that. 
Oh, like I said, I, I saw early on when I first came on, my mom was trying to do everything. It probably ended up giving her heart problems, you know. And, um, was she just working really long hours? Like, wh how late was she there? So much stress, you know, and, and just not giving herself enough of a break. So I think that being said, I saw that and I was like, you know what? If if she's delegated more, she would have, have been able to accomplish so much more yeah. in her career. Um but at the time, it's, it's like owners just want to do that. They want to try to do, you know, be everything to everyone and try to do everything. And it's something I learned early on that, hey, you know, I delegated it. You delegate out each department and um, communication is crucial, you know. And I think that um, the, the more communication you have with your teams, especially the managers, the better. So yeah. I just kind of ran with that. Yeah. So, Keith, what um, if people are, you know, looking at what kind of software – they should be using to run their business. What do you recommend from shipping to shopping cart to what, what software to use to run the, the online business? Um, we have partnered with um, Oslink and Indisha, which I think hmm. is not stocks.com. Yeah, I interviewed the founder of Indisha, yeah. And um, it's basically, um, we started u utilizing USPS for our shipping needs because they offer the flat rate service, which saved us just tons of money. We were really having problems with FedEx and UPS, like overbilling, you know, for certain delivery territories. And I made it tough to manage our, our cost. Mm -hmm. um, and they would just, you'd have all these surprise, you know, numbers on your bill. And it was, it was getting ridiculous. So USPS and, and Disha specifically allowed us to charge flat rate online or offer free shipping and then uh, Osling basically enabled us to, to auto batch our orders from online and to basically generate a seamless like um, packing slip and shipping tag on one piece of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take grab our orders and then basically sit on a on a set of business rules, uh, process the orders in a way where we we no longer had to do that. At one point, to be honest with you, we had like six or seven, eight, I mean eight people just processing orders manually at a certain point uh that the software that ability to be able to auto um uh, auto tag or auto make tags is it was wasn't available when i first yeah. came up so yeah um, that was a huge 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 uh huge boost boost to our business and our bottom line because we we're able to no longer have eight people on staff doing that. that's so. a huge difference yeah i moved them into shipping you know so what other software do you recommend um, we use QuickBooks Enterprise. I mean, right now, a lot of the QuickBooks products allow you to um, download the orders that you get online right into, you know, into the software. So it allows you to easily track your sales and you know, add new items and stuff like that. So I think, you know, the more automation, the better. But I mean, that's what we personally use. Yeah. And then Shopping Cart. I know you mentioned Shopify. Any other Shopping Cart platforms that you think people should take a look at? Um, WooCommerce, I think, is is definitely something that we um, will probably be integrating here pretty quick. So, mm -hmm. have a plugin. So, yeah, I'm not a real I'm not a real shopping cart master. I mean, um, kind of leave that up to the tech guys. But. Yeah. yeah, I know you mentioned automation a lot. So, you know, part of the a quick word from the sponsor. I'm always personally he thinking of automation. How can I do more more in less time? How can I ultimately automate things that will work better without me? You know, that's ideal. Um, so what I love about it is Cubana, I personally use them, that I can automate inventory management with multiple spread without the multiple spreadsheets or piecemeal softwares. And I could automatically send out inventory to customers from any platform from one fulfillment center and automate the purchase orders when they hit a certain level. And uh, you know, Scubana does combine all the software tools to run the e-commerce business. And I also love the SKU profitability report. So it tells me if things are actually profitable, if I should be keeping on with those SKUs or not. Um, so on that, um, we talked about, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the question, um, you know, what's been the lowest e-commerce moment for you? We haven't had one. I mean, like we've hit the ground running. So I never had a low, low point. I mean, with, we just had, you know, year over year growth. I mean, it's been phenomenal. And I think part of that's really, like I said, focusing in on those uh, conversion codes, automating. Um, I mean, 
if, if you focus in on that and continue to improve your product line and your products and the ingredients you use or whatever it is that you make, um, I think, you know, you'll have great success. So, yeah, I mean, it's a low moment, like since you're automating, what about if you, you know, there's like a long time staff that you have to let go because of automation or do you just move them to another department? Yeah, we, we just move them to a different department. I mean, the people that we replaced with, you know, making tags and printing tags, we moved them into shipping because all of a sudden we no longer had that. You know, we had more and more orders coming in because of our growth. So we always had a place to move them to or maybe they were interested in a different part of our business. So, you yeah. know, they're interested in baking or whatever it is. So it, it's it just um, allowed us to continue to hire within or promote people. Yeah. Yeah. And I want you to speak to any, you know, there's a couple things online about there's some controversy and I want you to speak about that just so they hear directly from you um, instead of looking on some website that has some claims about Julian Bakery. Yeah, you know, when, when I first came on back in 2009, um, my parents had a one of our products that we had was a low-carb bread that was out on the marketplace. And um, it was called Smart Car Bread. And back then, they were um, using software to analyze the, the bread. And um, that gives you the nutritional analysis. So um, one of the breads had an off amount of carbs because they were using the software analysis instead of what we do today, which is we send our products to Medallion Labs or LabSmart. We get a full lab verification. So if you're making a dietary product, yeah. it, it's all about the macros, you know, all about the nutritional facts, making sure they're accurate because it's really the number one thing you, you can do. And what that led to a, to us doing was a lab testing the product that we had we reformulated it so it was low carb using medallion labs and we relaunched it um and then uh, ever since then now we post our lab tests online which yeah. is great so it's like we have complete transparency we're actually one of the only companies that does that and um it's made it a lot easier it's just given us a whole new way of uh, developing products because if you think about it a lot of lo making a low carb product is pretty easy and um, you really just start off with low carb ingredients, and right. it's it's not that difficult to do. And especially when you are formulating, you just send stuff to the lab, and whatever they tell you it is, then you you launch it or you keep reformulating until you get the nutritional facts that you want. Right. What's interesting? So I do a lot of research ahead of time, and I read through some things. It was interesting about one of the claims is that. <laughs> They tested that, like you were saying, and they found that there was less fat in it than you claim. So wouldn't that be a benefit? Or do you know what I'm talking about? They they said, oh, like it was there was actually less fat in the actual bread that was actually on the label. So wouldn't that be a benefit? It would mean it would be a lower calorie. Yeah, yeah. I mean there are like um when you send stuff to the lab, I mean, it's of that specific batch. But, you know, when you're mixing, you could have, you know, some of the bread come out a little bit higher fat than other. But, right. um, I don't know, it just depends. Yeah. So, like I said, anytime that we have, we send stuff to the lab regularly. So, to keep it always accurate. Yeah. Most anytime, companies don't do that. What made you decide to publish the results online? Um, it just makes it a lot easier. I mean, that way we... You know, people are like, oh, well, you know, that's not low carb. Well, I'm like, all right, well, here's the nutrition facts. Plus, as somebody that has been on a diet, I wanted to do, I wanted to see that in, in when I buy a product. I want to see, okay, well, how are they getting these nutritional facts? Because there's so many bars and products on, currently on the market where either they use software testing or they're using software just to calculate these numbers. Yeah. They don't send. They don't spend a thousand dollars to send it to the lab to actually get the real nutritional facts. That means that their numbers are off. Yeah. You know? so. Yeah. Because I think I listened to you talk about this, and you use the same. You use use a lab that's also used by like General Mills and what lab we, do you? We use Medallion Labs, and we use another one. Um, it's called Lab Smart. Depending mm -hmm. on the type of testing that we need to do, but yeah, I mean, their big labs are one of the biggest around. So yeah. So on the flip side, Heath, what's been the proudest moment for you? Um, just seeing my daughter enjoy the products that um, I, I produce. You know, watching her and you know, I'll crave them and want more of them, and 
it's like, you know, she's excited when I come home from work because I'm always bringing back some, like, new product and stuff like that. I mean, there's really nothing better than to see her enjoy the products that I make. So, Which is and, her favorite? Uh, she loves, like, the chocolate brownie um, and the almond fudge bar that I bring back for her. Um, she loves the coconut wraps. She'll, like, make it into, like, a little fruit roll-up and she'll eat it because it's kind of... Are they sweet? Yeah, it's kind of a sweet kind of coconut, and so she'll roll them up. It's because they're dehydrated coconut water, coconut meat, and coconut oil. So it, you can roll them up almost into a fruit roll up, and you just eat them that way. Um, she likes the cereal. It's tough because some of their products we have have too much fiber, so I just cut it in half or give her a small amount of it. But yeah, um, I mean it's awesome. So I'm really excited about the kids' protein bar that we're yeah. uh, developing right now. But that's definitely the best moment. Yeah. Heath, I really appreciate your time and energy with this. This has been great. Um, I have one last question before I ask it. Tell people where can they check out your products? Where should they go online? Yeah, uh, go to joinbakery.com. We have hundreds of different products on on there and um, pretty much in any kind of uh, category um, that you want, whether it be cereal or bars or powders, um, but at joinbakery.com. We make it pretty much uh, the paleo diet really easy because we have the biggest selection of paleo products on the market. Yeah. Last question is, you know, the future for sure. Julian Bakery and um, you have big goals. You know, I want you to tell people about the goal of the, the company. I think um, really changing the way people eat and also making any diet easy are really our two biggest goals. Um, I think um, changing the way the masses eat. And not, you're going to see more and more people um, really going to a paleo or a primal way of eating, whether even if they're vegan, you're going to see them really go primal or primitive way of eating, whether it be like raw foods or just doing without all the junk. So our goal as a company is really to uh, provide products that are uh, for paleo, primal, and this new kind of up and coming trend called Pegan, which is the blend between paleo and vegan products. Hilarious. So yeah. we'll have products for all three of them. So. Right. Keith, thank you so much. Everyone should check out julianbakery.com. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much.